Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to uh, really cut through the noise and give you those essential nuggets of knowledge. Today, we're tackling something pretty significant, trying to fast track your understanding of modern cloud data engineering. So imagine this, you've got to build a you know, scalable, secure, cost-effective data platform from scratch for some fast-growing tech company. That's kind of the scenario we're using today to unpack uh, this set of insights we've curated, looking at critical bits in AWS and Snowflake specifically. Our mission really is to give you that practical know-how, how data gets managed, secured, optimized, even prepped for things like uh, machine learning in the cloud. Okay, let's dive in and unpack this. Yeah, and what's really interesting, I think, is how these aren't just like separate tools. They really combine, you know. Yeah. They form these powerful data architectures. We want to go beyond just what they do and really get into why they're so, well, indispensable today. Couldn't agree more. Let's start right at the uh, the foundation. You've got all this data, potentially chaotic. How do you bring order to it? We're talking managing, cataloging, querying that raw data. And um, when you talk centralizing metadata, AWS Glue Data Catalog just springs to mind, doesn't it? It's like more than just a simple database list, right? Oh, significantly more, yeah. Think of it as um, the ultimate librarian for your data lake. It's a fully managed service, a metadata repository, catalogs your data assets, tracks schema versions really carefully, manages metadata across all sorts of AWS services. And what's crucial here, you know, is it stops your data lake becoming that dreaded data swamp, that place where good data goes to get lost because nobody knows what's there. Glue turns that uh, that potential chaos into something you can navigate, discover. Mm. Makes governance much easier too. That's a great way to put it, librarian, not swamp monster. Okay, so you've cataloged it. Next logical step seems to be, well, asking questions of it, querying it. And that's where Amazon mm -hmm. Athena fits in. It's this serverless interactive query service lets you run standard SQL directly on S3 data. From your perspective, what's the big deal about it being serverless? What's the immediate win there? Well, serverless is just a game changer for um, agility and cost, definitely. Mm -hmm. You don't have to provision anything, set up infrastructure, manage servers, none of that. You just point Athena at your data in S3, write your SQL, and boom, it runs the query. It massively simplifies querying huge data sets right there in the data lake, cuts down operational headaches. But uh, that simplicity brings up a key performance question. What kind of data actually works best with Athena? Yeah, that's super practical. A question every data engineer hits, right? Athena really performs best with specific file formats, ones optimized for speed and uh, storage efficiency. We mean things like columnar formats, Parquet, ORC, and also row-based ones like Avro. These aren't just, you know, fancy names. They're designed to be really fast and compact for this kind of work. Exactly. And this is where it gets vital for anyone watching their cloud spend. It's not only speed, it's cost optimization. Using formats like Parquet, you seriously cut down the amount of data Athena needs to scan. And less data scanned means a smaller bill. Simple as that. Conversely, look, you can query plain old text files, TXT files. Technically possible, uh -huh. but they are absolutely not optimized for Athena. Performance will be way slower, cost much higher, because Athena has to scan the entire file mm -hmm. every time. That's a, let's just say, a quick way to learn about optimization through, well, painful experience. Huh, yeah, a lesson maybe learned the hard way sometimes. Okay, so that focus on optimizing for queries on S3 it kind of naturally leads us towards dedicated data warehouses like Amazon Redshift. There, these optimization ideas are taken maybe even further for heavy analytical workloads. How does Redshift really squeeze the most out of data storage for performance? Right. Redshift uses a couple of uh, key strategies. First is compression encoding. It basically shrinks the storage footprint of your data. Less data on disk means less data to read, so better I.O., ah. faster queries. Second, and maybe even more fundamental, is its use of columnar storage. So instead of storing data row by row like a spreadsheet, it stores it column by column. The brilliance here isn't just that queries can be faster, it's how it fundamentally changes analytical performance. Imagine you need just one column, like sales amount, across, say, billions of rows. A traditional row-based system loads everything, but columnar. Redshift just grabs only that sales column data. It makes some analyses that were, you know, practically impossible for feel instantaneous and way cheaper to run. That really is a powerful shift in how you access data. Okay, let's pivot a bit. Something totally non-negotiable for any data platform security. Especially securing that cloud data lake often built on Amazon S3. What are the absolute must-do best practices there? Okay, the cornerstones are always, always encryption and access control. You have to start there. You absolutely must enable encryption at rest, usually using AWS Key Management Service, KMS, to manage the keys and protect your data sitting there. Then, for controlling who gets to touch what, 
Use S3 bucket policies and IAM roles. That's identity and access management. These let you get incredibly specific with permissions. Super granular. Which brings up a really critical point about what not to do. Storing your S3 bucket credentials like access keys directly in your application code. That is a huge, huge security hole. Avoid it at all costs. Seriously, it's like um, leaving your house keys under the doormat, but for potentially your entire company's data. Just don't do it. Right. That analogy makes the risk crystal clear. Okay, so we've covered some solid AWS foundational and security stuff. Let's maybe broaden out now and look at another major player, Snowflake. How does it tackle some of these advanced capabilities? Especially around, say, data recovery. Their cross-region replication feature gets talked about a lot for cost-effective disaster recovery. Why is that such a big deal? Well, what's really compelling about Snowflake's cross-region replication is how it handles keeping synchronized copies of your data. It can do this across different geographic regions or even, interestingly, across different cloud providers. So AWS to Azure, for instance. This obviously boosts resilience massively, helps with business continuity. But it's the cost effectiveness that often stands out. Instead of you having to build and manage some complex, you know, active passive DR setup yourself, Snowflake just handles the replication pretty seamlessly. It often leverages the underlying cloud infrastructure really efficiently. So you get robust DR without that traditionally massive operational and capital cost. That's a serious benefit, yeah. Especially for planning resilient strategies. Now, something maybe a bit more day-to-day. -day. Creating filtered subsets of data, say from existing tables. Snowflake has that very direct create table as select command or CTES. Where does that kind of feature really shine for engineers or analysts who practice? Well, it's incredibly useful, a really common pattern, actually. You might use it to spin up a smaller filtered table for a specific analysis, mm -hmm. you know, without messing with the big original table. Or maybe you're prepping data for an ML model and you just want to pull out relevant features or its specific date range. CTS lets you do that quick sort of on-the-fly data prep and exploration. It's a powerful tool for fast prototyping, so setting data for other processes, or even just quick ad hoc checks. Makes sense. Now, one of Snowflake's most uh, famous features is definitely time travel. People talk about it a lot. It's almost like having, yeah, a data DeLorean, letting you see data as it was in the past, query it, clone it, restore it. Sounds incredibly powerful. But is there maybe a common misunderstanding about what it can or maybe can't do? It's incredibly powerful, a fantastic safety net, really invaluable for rolling back accidental changes, maybe a bad UP date statement, or recovering deleted data. The default retention is uh, just one day, but you can extend that up to 90 days if you're on their enterprise plus tiers. But a common misconception, yeah, is thinking it covers all your disaster recovery needs. Time travel is brilliant for that kind of operational recovery, fixing human errors, application bugs, things like that. But it's important to be clear that fail-safe is a separate feature. Distinct. Failsafe is designed for longer-term recovery from more catastrophic events, and time travel doesn't automatically enable it. So think of time travel as your short-term undo button, maybe up to 90 days. Failsafe is more like the deep long-term archive for recovery. Ah, okay. That's a really important distinction. Good to know the difference. Saves headaches later, I bet. All right, to sort of round out our deep dive here, let's touch on enabling advanced stuff like machine learning and also just keeping the network healthy. For managing the data feeding ML models, Amazon SageMaker Feature Store is a service that seems to be uh, really gaining traction. What's the core problem it's solving for ML teams? Yeah, it tackles a major headache for machine learning when you try to do it at scale, feature management. It's basically a fully managed central repository specifically for creating, storing, and crucially, sharing ML features. Mm -hmm. Before tools like this, you know, teams often ended up duplicating work, recreating the same features for different models, or really struggling with versioning consistency. Feature Store just makes it way easier to reuse features across models, even across different teams. It speeds up development, helps ensure consistency, and makes models more reproducible. Streamlining that whole messy process. Okay, last piece then. Just ensuring your network is solid especially uh, between cloud resources and maybe on-premises data centers in hybrid setups, that connectivity is vital. Amazon VPC Reachability Analyzer, that's the tool for checking that, right? Yes, absolutely indispensable for complex setups. VPC, that's Virtual Private Cloud Reachability Analyzer, is a diagnostic tool. It analyzes and verifies if network pads are open and working correctly between your AWS resources or between AWS and your own data centers via VPN or Direct Connect. In those complex hybrid environments, trying to manually figure out why something can't connect can be, well, a real nightmare. This tool gives you a clear, logical analysis of the path, highlighting any configuration issues like firewalls or routing problems, helps you troubleshoot connectivity way faster. It's kind of like having a, uh, a network detective on call. Network Sherlock Holmes. I like it. 
And uh, maybe a final thought to leave you with, as data just keeps exploding in volume and complexity, how do you think those core principles of data discoverability and governance things, exemplified by services like Glue Data Catalog, how might they need to evolve so we can actually maintain control and understanding over these ever-growing data landscapes? Something to ponder.